Yeah. 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 It's to celebrate a thing called life. I think that's how it goes. Thank you for being here this evening. Those of you, we will maintain social distancing, even though masks are not required. Most of us still have them and are wear them appropriately in drugstore. I, I did note in Walgreens this week uh, that they, they ask all of their customers that come in the store to please wear a mask. So some businesses are that way. Um, would like to encourage everyone to respect whatever the proprietor would ask when they're there. Uh, we have three, four, five things on the agenda. Mr. Baker, did you say something? No, sir. Okay. And we'll start off with Mr. Matt Dodd, and we've got a conversation to go on here. Appreciate y'all being here. Sorry I didn't get out there to say hello this evening. Appreciate everybody being here. We're going to maintain the department heads in here just like we normally do behind you, Bruce, and everybody. Uh, as the room should fill up with anybody that comes, we ask the department heads to leave the room so that we can maintain social distancing in the audience as well. So we've got, uh, we put on notice here to, we're going to discuss single family residential uh, rental homes, single family residential accessory buildings. Uh, I think we've got West Rankin Utility and our local agreements here, projects that we're working on and discussion of the city flag and one or two other things as they pop up at the last minute if we have time. So without further ado now, we're going to turn this over to our Community Development Director, Mr. Matt Dodd, and the uh, floor is yours, sir. Now, I have two topics, and I think first we'll start with the uh, single-family residential rental property don't topic. Want to, don't want to interrupt you, but for those of you that aren't familiar with the conversation what we're having here, there seems to be a lot of misinformation around, and it seems to be that, to me, that uh, there's an opinion out there in, in the community that Mr. Dodd is making decisions on his own uh, away from the board, which is, is not the case. And there's also an opinion out there that Mr. Baker, as the legal side of this, makes all the decisions for the board, and that's certainly not the case. Is it, Mr. Baker? So the board makes the decisions, uh, much like a, a, a group in a church. And sometimes it's the head pastor, it's not the mayor, it's the board makes the decisions. And we want, uh, for those of you that are here tonight, we want all the board members to know every facet of the discussion uh, related because it is important to us and the people we represent. So just to make sure that there's no board member that uh, is in error or not fully understanding is the reason why we're having this work session on this topic tonight. That help you, Mr. Dunn? Yeah, absolutely. Kind of give you a lead in. So that's what I felt it important at this point in time uh, to just have a on an important topic like this so we can talk about it. Okay, so the board may have questions, but the floor is yours, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so single family residential rental property and more specifically how that relates to uh, residential single family property being rented to individuals with disabilities. Uh, I am aware of four properties in the city of Brandon that are currently being rented to individuals with disabilities. The four properties in Brandon are managed by REM Mississippi. Uh, Ms. Jessica Matthews is here in the audience representing REM Mississippi and she has agreed to address the board if y'all have any concerns about uh, what they do in the homes and, and their management and the services they provide to the individuals that reside in the homes. Um, bottom line is a lot of 
what I've heard is that this should be classified as a group home, this use should be classified as a boarding house or multifamily use. Bottom line is this use is a single family residential use. Um, it's four individuals residing in a single family residential home, no different from any four non-disabled individuals living in a home. I have provided y'all with a letter specifically discussing the topic, specifically discussing our zoning ordinance and how it relates to this use. Um, but from community development standpoint and from our zoning ordinance standpoint, this is a single family residential use. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, about the letter, about any of the other um, exhibits I put in the letter, um, if y'all have any questions. And I know Jessica has agreed to um, discuss the services they provide with the board if y'all have questions for her. So, Matt, in conjunction with the opinion that you've reached today, you did consult with me, correct? Correct. And I did the research on the question, right? Yes. And we received information from the applicant and those involved with regard to the group home, I mean, with regard to this single family use, correct? correct. Did you know, and you may not have, but I'm just asking, did you know that at the time the city did its kind of comprehensive change to the zoning ordinance that the question, this question kind of came up as well in that regard? Okay. And, and, and for the applicant or the, this, this process to occur with, this, with regard to this particular home, there's no special permission that is requested or uh, that is required under our ordinance, correct? That's correct. Other than the, the process for the rent rent property for the inspections and things such as they follow the rental procedures, okay, correct. So there's no variance needs to be requested, there's no conditional use, there's none of these things. No. Okay. And you've provided to the board the um, information that was received from the owners of the home, um, but more importantly some of the federal law that's at, at, at issue here, correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to op open it up if y'all have any questions or if you'd like to hear from uh, Ms. Matthews. Um. Uh, the issue that, that I've heard from some concerned citizens that this is a group home. Well, it is not a group home. By definition in our zoning ordinance, a group home has to have at least six individuals residing in the home to even qualify to be a group home. The, these homes will have no more than four individuals residing in them. Well, wasn't some of the concern the nature of the, the history of the residents of the home, there was a contention or belief um, that there may be, this may be a drug treatment center, this may be a place, a halfway house for felons, this may be a lot of things. So if you could clarify, or maybe the lady um, who's I'm here. Happy to yeah. Absolutely. That's always what the concern is. You know, the individuals that live in the homes have to have intellectual or developmental disabilities. They're not. Okay. Sure. So it, um, it's not for sex offenders. It's not for drug addicts. It's for individuals that just require support to live in the community as independently as possible. So are you talking about on Pinecrest? Okay, so the ladies that live in the home do use wheelchairs, and so we do have a lift-equipped van at the home. Um, there is an older gentleman that is a neighbor who has um, actually threatened uh, the contractor who was working in the home. So there was a time when we were doing some renovations to make it fully wheelchair accessible that there was a lot of traffic. Um, and we do have staff, but one of the reasons we got that house in particular is because it's a very large driveway <laughs> so that we can avoid as many cars being parked on the street as possible. So traffic, well, 
Traffic and parking is often a concern, so I do try to find houses that either have long driveways or the house on Woodgate has an extra wide driveway. Um, otherwise, it's more the concern that we're gonna put sex offenders and drug addicts in the home, and that's not at all what we provide. Uh, well, actually, a couple of the ladies do have jobs, yes, um, in the community, but many of them also go to our day program, so they are usually gone during the day. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to hire anybody, I certainly can find you some work. So, so staff, back to Alderman Middleton's question about traffic, tell, tell us, Tell the board about staff. How does that work? Is it uh, is it always staffed? And how how do the, uh, we do provide 24-hour staff support? But as I said, they do leave typically during the day unless someone is ill or just doesn't want to go to the day program. Um, then we do have staff at home, but it's really based. The staff support level is based on the individual's needs. So. Um, for example, if I have two ladies that require, um, I'm saying ladies because that's all who lives there in the houses, but um, if they require quite a bit of physical assistance, like their total care, then we might have three staff on at one shift um, just because it, it requires a couple of staff to assist with bathing and personal cares. Um, otherwise, during the overnight hours, we typically have one staff on until 6 in the morning, and then starting at 6, we have a second person come in. No one lives in the home other than the four residents. Sometimes people will ask if the staff live there. I'm sorry, am I familiar with what? No, I'm not, um, but we shouldn't really have staff that park on the street overnight because the driveways are, are long enough um, and we only have one vehicle per house. So um, there shouldn't really be staff parking overnight on the street. I have a question since Chief Thompson is in the room. Have we ever had any issues at any of these uh, locations as far as police calls that have had to be made to any of those and board if you would please try to remember I know it's tough we've only been doing live streaming for a little while so we're not in the habit of cutting our microphones on and off but if you would use your microphone I know you did you get a gold star tonight thank you Miss Corley I haven't been made aware of any uh, there has been some concerns brought to my attention by residents over there concerning parking property values and like she said felons and uh, possible sex offenders living there I've assured them that that's not the case I've spoken to Matt about this these four residents have been absolutely no problem and I'd be happy to discuss the parking uh, ordinance with you and it sounds like you're going to be okay with it anyway okay. but uh they have been absolutely no trouble We've not received any calls. So if you would, have you summarized all of the uh, comments that you typically hear in a community or from a nearby resident or a next door neighbor? Um, I believe so. I mean, mostly it's people just wanting to know what's going on in there, but you know, I don't have a right to know what's going on in your home. So, <laughs> you know, it's um, if if we have registered sex offenders, we notify people. But the bottom line is, I've been working here at this company for 21 years, and I'm not going to put a registered sex offender right in the middle of a neighborhood anyway. Uh, that would just create problems. So, we try to make sure if it's an individual that might have um, more negative behavioral issues they live in more rural communities not right on top of neighbors like they do in cross gates so try to be smart with placement okay uh, mr. Baker mr. Dodd if you would go through the uh, legal standing and, and the reasons why that uh, 
you feel like uh, the opinion of the city of Brandon now is uh, in compliance with uh, all state and federal statutes? Mark, you want to handle that one? <laughs> well, uh, preliminarily, based on the, the description, which we have no we reason to question and which we've seen a prior track record on, based on the description as being proposed for the, for the use, number one, it conforms to our, our current zoning order. So setting everything else aside, you would say the use as proposed conforms to the zoning ordinance. Um, in addition to that, there are myriad of federal laws that address this question, um, not only from the ADA, but also from the Fair Housing Act and, and other um, federal uh, protections that are in place um, that essentially say that um, can't discriminate on the, on, on the basis of disability when it comes to a housing question like this. Now, if there was a clear and recognizable threat um, to the health, safety, and welfare of the citizenry, the board could take some action. Um, none has been expressed, and, and according to the chief, we've not seen any in any prior examples that we have currently. But if, and in fact, that becomes an issue, then there are things, of course, there are nuisance ordinances that the city has. There are other things. The, the other authority in law that the city has but but to begin with the fundamental question is does it comply with zoning which it does and are there federal protections in place otherwise that would permit this and there are and so that's a general summation of the law and I can give you the just the various sites if you need those at some point but um, um, I would also at, as an aside this issue somewhat came up with the city of Jackson some time back, and a consent decree was entered in 2017 generally about the subject with regard to the city of Jackson. And so um, this has become very fairly settled law in the area. Do well, you have anything to add to that, Matt? No. All right, board. I just felt like it was important for one, you all hear the same thing at the same time, uh, which I've heard, and uh, we are abiding by laws as they exist today, and uh, appreciate Matt doing that. And I know it's going to be a little while before we get to our board meeting, but we have public comment in our board meeting when we kick it off at 6 o'clock. If you don't mind, stick around for a little while, just in case some other resident was misinformed. We tried to get the word out a little bit that we were having this work session. If there were any questions that might come up, you'll be here to, to further discuss sure. or answer those. We'll appreciate that. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Jane. Uh, is this something that you're going to expand on? Um, no more in cross gates. I mean, we have three houses in cross gates, and I mean, I have no idea how many houses are there. But um, you know, the 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 goal of uh, community living is that you're integrated fully into the community. So the last thing I want to do is put a bunch of houses with people with disabilities in them all together. So, but we do cover the whole state. So I have houses all around the state. Um, just these four happen to be here because. Brandon overall is a very safe city and the, the houses are, are nice and affordable. So that's why we're here. And for the most part, all the neighbors have been pretty pleasant. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Matt, we're going to shift over to some discussions about uh, accessory buildings. Y yeah. We, I hope, hopefully this will be fairly quick. I, I provided you all with another handout. Um, showing the section of our zoning code relating to accessory buildings. Correct. That's it, Mayor. Yes, that's it. That, this is the only section in, in our code that relates to accessory buildings. Um, the only thing we dictate on accessory buildings in the city of Brandon really is placement and size. And you can see it's, it's based on the district. Um, we we permit uh, accessory buildings based on their location, relationship to the lot, and to the other structures on the lot, um, height and size, and that's it. We do not get into 
um, architectural control. We do not dictate uh, what materials it's constructed out of. We don't dictate colors. Um, and, I, and I've had some questions about some accessory buildings, so I thought it was important to have this discussion with y'all re relating accessory buildings. Um, this is our current ordinance. Certainly if y'all think we need to consider something different with it, I'd be open to discussing it um, and coming up with something different. But this, this is what we have. Yeah, again, this is a, a topic that comes up board from time to time. Uh, and someone will move something in that uh, doesn't fit in a neighborhood. Some neighborhoods have more aggressive homeowner associations that catch that. Others, like Crossgates, I don't remember how many years ago it was that those uh, covenants expired. Uh, anybody want to throw a guess out? I, 15, 20 years ago, I think, uh, they were when they were written, uh, there was no sunset, there was a sunset clause in there. So they existed for 25 years, and there are no covenants uh, in Crossgates any longer, as some of the newer subdivisions have. So that pre it creates problems. Uh, and rears his head up from time to time and sometimes uh, myself included we don't uh, answer inquiries probably in the most correct context so I felt like uh, we need a moment here to talk about accessory buildings any board member have questions about accessory buildings and locations Mark you want to say anything about accessory buildings no. Man, I, I didn't know this was coming up. I apologize. Actually, I think I remember the mayor mentioned something to me. I just didn't, it didn't click in my mind that we were going to talk about it tonight. Would you take the time after the meeting and look at the uh, site plan and building plan review? I mean, excuse, yeah, the site plan, basically our architectural review ordinance. Okay. And, and see whether or not you don't believe that there may be a way to fit some of this review in that. Um, I'm not saying there is or isn't, but I, re I remember there was, and it may be that we changed that when we did the ordinance, but, um, and you may already know the answer to that. And, I, uh, I'm not sure what the old ordinance said. I do know, I could not find anything in our current ordinance that um, related to any type of architectural control over accessory buildings. We do have the development table, development section, development standard section of our zoning ordinance. It does not relate to accessory buildings or single-family residents um, honestly we don't we don't control you know, what the single-family homes look like um, just like we don't control what single-family accessory buildings look like but another one that's raised his head board is sometimes uh, I know on highway 80 uh, sometimes we get into color schemes and things like that we don't uh, regulate the color of buildings that comes into contention sometimes uh, along with architectural control uh, and all those things, the things that we're mentioning, are within your purview to control, if you so choose. Uh, we need to set about uh, doing those things. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, this has probably got some of you thinking about some, some issues that we need to address going forward. But it's that, old, it's that old adage of how much government's good at home. You know, all government starts at home. So how much government do you want in your, in your back door on your neighbor's house? Well, that's a ongoing question right mm -hmm. yes okay so any further questions on accessory buildings at the moment I can say this. Yeah. thank you appreciate it I'm not for any control of accessory buildings in cross gates period and the reason why is probably 95 percent of them have a building so you're gonna come in now you're gonna put the other five percent and they're gonna say I want to do this and you're gonna we're gonna go no but you look around their house and the other six neighbors have got that building. So, I mean, it's just, I'll say that just from my standpoint. In my house, there are seven buildings, and I told you this, accessory buildings. They are all seven different. Yeah. So why in the world do we want to go try to control now in Crossgates? Now, homeowner associations, they have control. But Crossgates is 40 plus years old and I just can't see it. Everybody may disagree with me, but it's just probably 95% of the homes have one. And it would be crazy for us to try to go in now in that area and try to start. Because I'm just saying, every one of them is different. They all are. Okay. 
Any further questions for Matt Don while you got him at the podium? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next I'm going to ask Charles Smith to come to the podium to talk about uh, some West Ranking Utility Authority stuff. Who are you pointing at? Mark? Chris, can you help me out? You help? Would you give uh, James and Lou one of those, please? All right. Let's see. Trying to, there we go. There's two. You would pass it down, please. All right. Board, as you're aware, uh, we, uh, on behalf of West Ranking Utility Authority, we entered a, uh, and looked for an interlocal agreement with the AG's office with the authority. Where'd Bruce go? Bruce Stevens was here just a minute ago. Bruce left. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who is the only employee, really, of uh, West Ranking Utility Authority. But we put forth uh, these projects. There are five projects I just gave you. Uh, so... Marcus and Linda, this, I don't mean this to sound confusing, you're really not. In order, order for us to do anything with West Ranking Utility Authority, we've got to have an AG's opinion for, uh, we had to get one and West Ranking Utility Authority had to get one. And then each subsequent member, Flowood, Pearl, Richland, Air, J City of Jackson through the airport, uh, the state and PRV, we all had to get interlocal agreements in order to allow West Ranking Utility Authority to work inside the city of Brandon. And these are some of the projects that we talked about, six of them on here. Uh, these were the first uh, five, excuse me, five. These were the first five that came to mind that we could move on pretty quick that we already had done the engineering on and kind of turned them over. So Charles, you you have this? I don't of? have it, but I do uh, remember the would list. You, I'm not sure what order they're Do you in. like my copy? Or yeah, get that one. Okay. And if you would, just very briefly, we've got, uh, it's 531, so you got 10 or 15 minutes you can work through All this. Right. i got two issues I'd like to talk about when you get done. So project one is uh, sanitary sewer improvements at Shiloh Park. Uh, that is an improvement to the way that that line cuts across Shiloh Park. Right now it cuts back against the flow of the next line coming in that runs along Richland Creek. This project will put in a new line that will actually bring it across and run with the flow. So that's going to uh, solve a couple of issues for us, mainly dealing with capacity of flow coming through that area. Sure. Also, the older line that runs across uh, that shallow park area does need some work on it. So this will allow us to do that work without having to bypass that line. I'll do so, an and two as you go through these. Uh, so. A lot of people don't realize it, but the what's called small ball area, 100 years ago used to be a, 100 years ago, it's for, it's being silly. Uh, was at one time a lagoon and there was a lift station that pumped it over uh, Lewis Wilson before the big main came mm -hmm. around. So this is why that exists. And this, so this is straightening out a main that uh, I know Chris and Harry were with me one, uh, one day when uh, we had a big rain event out there and it's just gotten worse. Uh, so we're gonna straighten that flow out you got two lines almost coming directly at each other. When they hit in a big rain event, everything settles out. And mm -hmm. I feel like that line is probably three-quarters of the way stopped up. So that's going to be part of that is yeah. cleaning all that out. Mayor, I've seen the manhole sitting on top of water this time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The pressure of water coming out of the manhole with the old manhole. Yeah. Chris, the, the, these projects that we're going through, these five, are, are not required by us to be bid. These are West Ranking Utility Authority projects, so we just, we're just we apprising you. You're aware of a lot of these, and as Charles goes through them, I'll add to it. Uh, but uh, they're, they're going to move pretty quick on these to solve these problems for us. Okay. Item two is uh, listed as Sunny slash Terrapin Skin Creek Sanitary Sewer Improvements. This will be a collector to tie in to the existing Terrapin Skin Creek main line. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went ahead and put in a crossing right there behind Sonny's in anticipation of hopefully being able to do this project. What this will do is it will do away with multiple service line crossings that cross that creek. Uh, those have always been an issue. Uh, they get broken from time to time by debris coming down the creek. 
and this will allow those individual businesses to have a dedicated line to tie into so that their service line does not have to leave their property and cross over other person's property to get to our main line and we'll get those lines out of the creek so that way we'll have a single crossing versus the five that exist there now so one of the first things i did as mayor uh, several years ago was climb down in the ditch on a friday afternoon to connect that four inch sewer line back up so she could open old town yeah so it's a matter of you know it's always a problem it's been a problem and we're fixing to solve that problem and i think that property has just been sold uh, so I look forward to that business opening mm -hmm. in the very near future. Yep. So that helps that business out as well. Okay. The crossing behind Sonny's was taken out a couple of years ago by probably a large log or something coming down the creek. When we put it back in, we put it back in uh, with a size of pipe and in a manner that will facilitate this project. So it's already there. We just need to tie to it. Uh, project three is Richland Creek lift station improvements. Uh, we have two older HOMA pumps. We've had issues for years. One of those pumps is actually down. So we're going to take this opportunity to do some renovation to that uh, lift station. The elbows that go into the pipe at the bottom have a couple of issues that are causing some vibrations on those pumps. Probably had something to do with this last pump going out so we're going to correct those issues so this project is a renovation of that existing lift station which will primarily be centered around two new pumps i think this is the third or fourth time in the last seven years we've replaced one or both of these pumps mm -hmm. harry this is behind the high school what you thought was a water well this is that force main that comes from the th whole third of Brandon goes through those pumps and goes up Highway 18 to get to Marquette over yeah. here where the metering station's at. So mm -hmm. that's one critical place. Now you're going to talk about the next one. Project four is the Apple Ridge lift station improvements. Uh, similar issue. Uh, we've got a pump that's down, so we're going to replace that pump. We're also going to make a few improvements to the station to go along with that. Uh, we also on Sunday lost our second pump. Now, fortunately, it is uh, the pump is not completely torn up, so it is going to be able to be uh, rebuilt. It's just a bearing change out. Uh, our bypass pump cranked up, did what it was supposed to do. Uh, the guys have been managing that, so the station is operating. But this will replace uh, the pump that went bad that we cannot rebuild and take care of a few renovation items on that station as well. So Monica, at the end of Apple Ridge down there, at least two times those pumps have gone out. It creates a bad sanitary mm -hmm. problem, uh, odor problem, and we've addressed that. Haven't had that problem in the last couple of years, but uh, yeah. again, the bypass pump did work. So without the bypass pump, we'd have been right back in the same boat. So we're upgrading both of those. That will uh, also help us out. Uh, with what we'll do as an SRF project of the Apple Ridge force main that goes from there. So both of these are really tied together in two different locations on the same main, except the second one on Apple Ridge also takes in, uh, let's see, Sun Chase, Sun, yeah, Wind Chase, Sun Chase, all the way down outside the city coming up mm -hmm. 468. Every bit of that goes yep. through, this, through that area. Okay. Yeah, it's a large percentage of our sewer flow goes through Apple Ridge. Okay. So. Uh, project five is North Street sewer improvements. Uh, this project will allow us to eliminate the lift station that is on North Street just adjacent to the new courthouse. That lift station was put in years ago because the line that exists in North Street has collapsed. So this project is a pipe bursting project to open that line back up and get it operational. And that way we'll be able to, re to uh, do away with the lift station. So, Marcus, that's that wooden fence that you see down at the bottom of the hill. We want to get rid of that. We uh, want to get rid of the trees. Uh, that's directly across the street from the new courthouse. Uh, it's not a problem. It's just an eyesore sitting there. It can be remedied pretty inexpensively. And, by the way, the North Street, that section of North Street, is not ours to pave. The, city, the county is paving that at their yes. leisure. They were working on some curb and storm drain inlets, if I'm not mistaken. But they should be getting to that in a short order, I think. Yes. So that's a brief description on those five projects that will be happening pretty quick. So I want you to be aware of those. Charles, these are yours too. Uh, Mayor, it's my math person that probably has a million dollars in cost here. No, sir, that's... So everybody knows we're to the 
And that's coming from West Rankin Utility Authority. It's not coming out of our coffers. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about those, what I just gave you later. We get a chance. All right, city flag, sir. Biden time here to have something that has Brandon on it, if I'm not That's mistaken. Right. Do I need to hand out these? I don't think so. Okay, fine. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to talk without the mask. I feel like I'm doing a Simply Safe commercial. Uh, this, this is the evening. We've been working on this design and selecting this flag for the last three or four meetings. And we're finally there. And I'm excited to show you the prototype tonight. I've asked Angela if she will come forward and, and help me with this. Since you're on the other side. Here we go. <laughs> if you will note, we've got correct colors on the flag. We've got a nice, clean design. I've got a couple of other flags I want to show you. And once we see those, you'll see why, the, why this design you guys selected is a nice, clean design. There's another aspect that I want to talk about this flag. Uh, this flag, and it has to do with printing processes. This particular uh, flag has a digital print, and a digital print is much like your office color printer, where it puts the colors down as the material goes through. It makes for a quick uh, uh, flag, but it doesn't hold up as well. It'll, it'll fade. The UV, uh, these colors fade with UV. So what I want to do now is to show you a screen printed flag. In this case, it's a different process to so use screen print ink. Here we go. Put this down, and so the flag lasts longer. It's much less, much less fade from this particular process. When you see this flag, you'll see that you guys have chosen a really nice, clean design. You don't have choo-choos on your flag, but. This means something to these folks, so it's meaningful to them. So with that, what I, what I would suggest, I, I've got, uh, I would suggest that, uh, one, we need, do we need to approve this prototype, or have we done that already, Mayor? Being that it's so light, like, as the sun shines through it on the reverse side, are you going to be able to see the logo? It's a single uh, side flag. Uh, so you see the reverse side on a single side flag. Only flags like the United States flag can be s exactly the same on both sides because you've got the same stripes on both sides, you've got the same field on both sides, you've got the stars in the same place. When you get into putting a design on the flag, uh, it becomes much more difficult because what you can do is create a, a design on both sides that's printed positive, but you've got to put a liner in there, and it doesn't fly very well. It's like a great big towel flopping up there. So most flags like this are single-sided flags. And so, you know, you'll, you'll see positive from one way and a reverse from the other side. But that's, that's the way these are. Um, so. What I'm suggesting is that you guys consider ordering the flags as screen printed flags because they, they will last longer. And as you can see with this flag, you get a much more dense color on that and it'll fade less. Does anyone have any questions on these? I do. Yes. That Brandon flag that you held up seems very discolored to me. It looks orange and brown. Say again. That Brandon flag that you held up looks very discolored. It looks orange and brown instead of red and black. These are the PMS colors that's designated in your code. So you guys don't actually have a red. It's a slightly off red 
that uh, has a PMS exact color, and the and the and the band down here is not black; it's a deep charcoal gray, and both of these colors are specified by your uh, logo code. So that's the reason the colors are as they are. Okay, I'm just making comparison to like our letterhead, making Pardon? comparison to our letterhead, which is basically what that was modeled off of it's a much deeper red here than the way it appears I so can't that's control why I control the asking. letterhead what I do is I follow by the PMS uh, specifications on your on your color codes mayor how many flagpole stations do we have that have three poles together two so we only need two of these then basically there's one uh, the downtown square and Shiloh Park has three other than that Pardon me? Yeah. We have three different places at Shiloh? Two. No, there's three poles at Shiloh on top of the hill. I think it's just that one spot where there's three poles. City flag. Yeah. No, sir. It, we did. It's only one pole out there now. Uh, on square. Are there some other questions on this? Uh, I, I presented the mayor with a uh, list on this that gives a pricing for both the digitally printed flags and for the screen printed flags there's a slight difference in this and the screen printing flags cost less the, the higher quantity that you purchased and when you get to that decision i suggest you consider buying a number of flags to replace the ones as they wear out and fade uh, uh, the, the cost is is significantly better for you purchasing a number of flags I've also uh, presented uh, uh, two by three flags, which I don't have a sample for, but they're smaller flags. So these are the type of flags that usually fly under the United States flag. For example, at your police department or at the library or in one of the flagpoles downtown, I mean down at uh, Quarry Park. And, and uh, so those are options for you as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Where did Charles Smith get off to? Monica, to, to address your question, Charles, I can't see you behind that pole. Charles had the same issue on uh, the color scheme on the water towers using a logo. And actually they chose some, some better definition colors, darker, so that it would look better in daylight rather than on the letterhead. Yeah, we had the same issue. We gave them the color code that's listed on our Brandon branded logo and when they printed the samples of it uh, same problem it looked orange and brown not red and black of course it's it is a different type of red and it's not black it's dark charcoal gray but we actually had to take our logos that are printed and visually match them up with a couple, couple of different samples to get the right color I, I don't know why that is the tank company assured me that they had given their paint contractor uh, the color numbers. Uh, we even talked to them, they matched up, but visually uh, it was it was not quite that orange and brown, but it was the same problem. So well, thank you for catching that and, and taking care of it because it would have been horrible to have ended up with that on the water tower. Yes. No, yeah. All right. We'll take that under advisement and continue to work on it. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Board, I have four quick things. Since we have 10 minutes before, I've got 548. So, one, I want to give you a street update. Uh, we are uh, nine weeks into a, really a 17 week schedule. There have been 49 streets resurfaced, which is 53% of the 91. So we're ahead of the curve on that. Most of the outlying stuff has been completed, and I think they're concentrating on now on what's remaining, which is the bulk of what's in uh, 
cross gates. So I know that I think they were on Hunter Cove or something about to begin up Woodbridge and going around. It's going to be some long pulls in there with all the cul-de-sacs, but uh, they're moving quick. Got great weather. And that's been achieved uh, in, in between two storms. So we had two storms, one in Louisiana and one come up Alabama. So we suffered through that and made it through it. Uh, so that's the update on that. We're at 53 percent of capacity. We're again the uh, second week of December is completion date. Uh, refinance. Uh, we finalized a refi uh, five million one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars. This was the bonds uh, six years ago that we built three fire stations, renovated Shallow Park, and renovated. Uh, City Park and built restrooms at City Park where there were none so people wouldn't have to go into the library uh, Five million left on that. It was the interest rate was 4.4 percent uh, And we refined that at 1.85 percent. So that was concluded and closed on Thursday. Really great news. Appreciate that Saved us approximately four hundred thousand dollars over the life of that. So we've got 14 years to go on that. So uh, initiative 65 there's a lot of uh, TV and radio now pro 65 I can tell you uh, get, I printed some of these left them in the back I gave you each one of the uh, copy of this the Mississippi Municipal League and the Mississippi Police Chief Association have taken a position uh, of no and I just thought it'd be helpful for you to have a hard copy of what uh, the league has taken a position on uh, and again, Mr. Baker spoke last time on the difference of those and can do that again in public comment tonight if you'd like. So you've got a hard copy of that. And last time I gave you a uh, resume by Mr. from Mr. Stephen Dickey, who's taught at Mississippi State University for almost 33 years. I met with him this past week. And we rode around Quarry Park and looked at some of the problems and issues that we have. And I have somewhat of a work outline for him. I sent you an email, even belatedly here just a little while ago. And uh, he will graciously work for uh, $100 an hour or $500 per day if we should need him. Chris, I'm going to hand you three of these too, please. This is a schedule of things that uh, he and I discussed uh, through this fall and spring of how he could help us. There you go, Harry. And you'll see some things in there like uh, chainsaw training, and I think everybody in public works and parks and rec needs, we need that uh, not only from a liability standpoint, we need that in employees' folders they participate in that, but anybody using a saw. I mean, I, I remind them, I had a dear friend, Chuck Herman, uh, division chief in Rochester, Minnesota, that was killed but a, in a horrible tree accident some years ago cutting firewood. Uh, last year, in the month of October, I believe, we had a storm that came through Forest on Highway 35 north of Forest. It was an MDOT employee uh, that was killed, uh, chainsaw accident, felling a tree after a storm. So it's just a case of I think we need to be careful. So we've got a lot of trees and replanting and poisoning and that kind of thing as we uh, parks. We need somebody, we need to begin to look at the entire city, Crake Myrtles, downtown, our parks and everywhere else. Uh, we need to have somebody that's kind of a go-to person, an arborist that can advise us on how better to take care of trees and that kind of thing. So I'd like to add him tonight it's on me. I mean, I thought I got it to Angela, and I evidently did not to, uh, to get it on the agenda tonight. But I'd like to hire him at $100 per hour, $500 per day. I don't even know that he's going to charge us, to be honest with you. But uh, very pleased that he's here. Very glad that he would be working with us and helping us and training our employees. Going to be teaching our employees how to prune trees, plant trees, relocate trees, and all those kind of things. So I'd like to add him, Mark and Angela, please. Boy, when we get to that. So Mark, that'd be a number something. I don't have a, can I put it under the clerk? Please, put it under the clerk. Put it as number seven. Yes, please. I'd appreciate that. Seven's fine. She's happy with that. She's got a smile on her face. I didn't want to do that last time when I gave you his resume until I had time to visit with him and carry him around the park and show him some of what we were trying to do. All right. So that finishes up a work session. Uh, board, do you have anything else? You comment? I did have a, a comment this week, and it was just a, an off-the-wall comment about uh, are we going to have a Christmas parade? And yes, folks, we're going to have a Christmas break. Yes, folks, we're going to have a veteran's breakfast. Right, Laurie? Yes, 
we are going to have a veterans breakfast and we will maintain as much social distancing and, and those type of things as we can. Yes, ma'am. When is the city celebrating Halloween? <laughs> that is the <laughs> annual question that we always get. When is the city celebrating Halloween? Very difficult question, you know. Halloween is Halloween, October 31st. Always has been, always will be. City doesn't celebrate Halloween. If neighborhoods and homeowner associations want to do something differently, if it falls on a weekday or a Sunday, they're certainly entitled to do so. And we've learned over the years that they should not get on social media and promote that, that they should just handle that on a door-to-door -door campaign. So Halloween, as far as the city is concerned, is Halloween. This year it falls on a Saturday. I'm sure Chief Thompson and uh, is really looking forward to that. Might be an eventful night. So anyway, thank you for that question. So we get it every year. Uh, it's just, you know, so you know, about three weeks ago is when it finally popped up when we were celebrating Halloween. So we celebrate Halloween on Halloween, if you celebrate such as that. All right. So uh, thank you for working through a uh, topic-heavy uh, work session. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, you got any questions or thoughts? Uh, we've got uh, Laurie. We have, since we're still in a work session, we've got five minutes. I want you to take one minute and come up here to the podium, please, and tell us about October 24th. I got fussed at last week because I didn't say that, but that is this Saturday we're doing a fall festival. This Saturday yeah, is a fall festival. Um, the gates will open at 12 o'clock. We have some vendors coming. We have all kind of fall games, music, DJ type music, um, a cornhole tournament. Y'all can join. Um, we have a car show that will be out front. Tickets or wristbands are $5, and that will get you into the movie that evening, which is Hocus Pocus at 6 o'clock. 6.15, I'm sorry. So we have a lot of activities, treats, hayride. So a lot of different activities going on. Hayride runs from when to when? 12 to 5, 12 to 5.30. And just, board, I want to reemphasize, this is not a, a spooky kind of thing. This is for families and young kids. Correct. Uh, and that's kind of our focus is, you know, we want young kids to be able to get out and enjoy outdoor. And it looks like we're going to have good weather. So it thank you like for your weather. continued work. And the Mayor's Youth Council is going to be there in force, right? Yes, sir. Working hard. Dynamite. All right. We've got a couple of minutes, and then we'll begin our board meeting sharply at 6 o'clock. Thank you.